So I uh, have been given the task to give an introduction to that uh, panel today. And so why is decentralizing our food system crucial for our society today? Our food system produces a lot of negative externalities. It has a lot of negative impacts. One third of the food produced is thrown away, while 842 million people are starving. We have lost 75% of the diversity of the crops that we cultivate. We have lost a lot of nutrients also in our food. We say that an apple from 100 years ago worth 100 apples today for the vitamin C, for example. Health issues, the rise of uh, obesity, diabetes, autism, cancers, that are probably partly due to pesticides as well. Uh, antibiotic resistance. There are eight times more antibiotics sold for the intensive livestock in the US than for hospitals. And the food system also produces a lot of plastic waste. We talk about the seventh continent of plastic in the ocean. So this is also a consequence of our food system. And of course, water pollution, there are 400 dead marine zones in the ocean. But also very uh, worrying, Farmers distress. There are 370,000 farmers committing suicide using pesticides every year. And the food system is also responsible for half of the carbon emissions, so it has a lot of a huge impact on climate change as well. So this being said, if we ask why, why are there dead mine zones? Why is there water pollution? Why, why, why? We finally end up with centralization being the root cause for most of those negative symptoms. Over the past decades, the food system went through a wave of mergers and acquisition, horizontal and vertical concentration and integration. So the power today is concentrated in the hand of very few corporations who control food production, processing and distribution. The Bern organization, a Swiss NGOs, has written an amazing report showing why and how decentralization uh, is the major cause of all those negative impacts. So I wanted to share with you two or three examples so that you, you understand the link. We talked about dead marine zones. There are 400 dead marine zones in the ocean. Why? Because of the use of synthetic fertilizers that produce eutrophication, there is a low oxygen rate in the water, so the fish can't live. So why are those synthetic fertilizers used? Because the soil are too poor. So you need to, to put fertilizer so that the plant can grow. But why are the soils so poor? Because of monoculture. Big farmers have bought lands of other farmers, small farmers who stopped their activity. So they became even bigger. And when farms become bigger, they change their uh, farming practices change and toward monoculture and they use so that they can use big tractors and they can like produce bigger quantity and uh, increase uh, the productivity so concentration of land in that case is the final why we said 370,000 farmers commit suicide every year why because they use seeds that need pesticides and most of the time they also practice monoculture, so the crops are at risk, they are very fragile. If a disease touches the crop, the whole field could disappear. The, the companies that, own, that control the seeds uh, industry are the same as the one that controls the pesticide industry. So they sell seeds that need pesticides, and they also sell hybrid seeds that don't reproduce reliably. So the farmers need to buy new seeds every year, and they, of course, need to buy pesticides so that they don't lose their whole, their, their whole production. The marketing teams have convinced the farmer to use the super productive seeds, but then the farmer end up in a situation where they are dependent on the seed and pesticide industry. And on the other side, they are also dependent on the traders, on the centralized trading system, which propose very low price and, and most of the time follow very fluctuant uh, uh, cereals or um, yeah, the, the market prices which are very fluctuant. So the farmers are really compressed in between centralized seeds and pesticide industry and centralized trading system. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> and about distribution, here again, there are very few 
powerful traders and distributors that control the market. And the, to control the distribution is very strategic position because you control both what consumers buy and what producers grow and how they grow it. So it's a very po powerful position. Just to illustrate how this uh, distribution has been concentrated over the past decade, I want to show you some figures. Like in 2000, in Europe, only eight member states has their top five retailers controlling more than 60% of the retail market share. 11 years later, it's 13 member states representing more than half of the population of Europe. With the concentration of the distribution come along the concentration of the supplier because the big wholesalers that deliver the supermarket chains, they need to buy a huge quantity at a very low price so they will buy to big intensive monoculture producers or big food processors and small farmers can't really sell through those channels which are the one where which are the most um, uh, used by people today oops so if we want to to build a food system that does not produce all those negative externalities that we mentioned maybe decentralization can be a solution i like to take this example th the comparison with the third industrial revolution from jeremy rifkin every building is becoming a micro facility of to produce energy and in this model the surplus of energy is sold distributed to through smart grids smart networks that enable energy to circulate in a distributed network so maybe this image could apply to the food sector and i think we see signals of a transition going in that direction first on the distribution level there are a lot of micro facility micro scale production that are uh, uh, popping up everywhere at, uh, so we, we talk a lot about the maker movement, but I would like to talk about the grower movement. More and more people grow on their balcony, in their garden. You probably heard about the incredible edible movement, for example. But also on a more professional level, the, the project uh, Ferme d'Avenir, Farms of the Future in France, want to support the deployment of 50,000 micro farms of one hectare. So you have all these distributed production, micro-scale production network who is em which is emerging, both on a gardener level and a micro-farm level. Along with this distributed production, we need, of course, seeds and free seeds to be able to, to produce all that. So there are, again, a lot of community initiatives like seed swaps or open source license that are emerging on seeds so that the seeds remain a common goods that anyone can use and share and exchange. Along with this distributed production network, we need ways to, for in knowledge and tools to circulate. And again, there are a lot of initiatives, of course, a lot of local associations where you can learn how to grow vegetables on a peer-to-peer -peer level, but also platforms like WeFarm, for example, uh, where a farmer in a developing country can send an SMS if he has a disease on a crop, for example. This SMS will be sent to a network of farmers and those who had faced the same problem and managed to solve it can share their knowledge. So it's really a P2P network. You have also more and more uh, libraries where uh, designs are shared to build and maintain your own farming tools. So open source hardware for agriculture. And you also even have peer-to-peer -peer renting platform to rent um, farming uh, tools. Again, in this paradigm of a decentralized production network, you need adapted finance tools to enable all those micro farms to emerge. And there are some dedicated finance tool, finance platforms which are emerging, like Bluebees, for example, in France, which finance, uh, which is dedicated to agroecology projects, a crowdfunding, crowdfunding platform. I said distribution is a strategic position. So again, you have a lot of initiatives popping up everywhere. Buying group, CSA, um, cooperative supermarkets, 
uh, platforms that reconnect producers and consumers on a B2B and on a B2C level. Marketplaces where every, anyone, any, anyone can create a diversity of food hubs and enable the food to move in a decentralized network. So I won't detail more because we are going to talk about it in the panel, uh, but uh, these could be compared at the smart grids of the food uh, sector. So just to conclude, uh, I wanted to ask the question, like maybe decentralization is paving the way toward a new age of agriculture, an age of agro communities. And this gives me a lot of hope because as a buyer, we can, as a consumer, we can buy through Zoo's independent distributor of food hubs. Buying is voting, isn't it? As makers, we can start growing in our garden, in, in our balconies. And as entrepreneurs, we can start food hubs in our neighborhood or even build a micro farm. Why not? So I'll leave the speech to Anne Sophie. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Miriam. <laughs> oh, stay on stage, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have a seat, please. Okay, decentralization, I was more used to relocalization as well, so it's an interesting topic of discussion. I will welcome on stage right now Maxime de Rostolan from Ferme d'Avenir. You can applause. <laughs> Maxime! <laughs> <laughs> also from California, Nancy, alors I will, Zameriowski from Yellow Seed. We will explain what's Yellow Seed. Welcome, Nancy. <laughs> And Marc David Choukroun from La Ruche qui dit oui. Uh, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being with us. Um, first question, quickly, one minute, one pitch, maybe to explain people what you are working on. Maxime first. <coughs> Hi. Uh, Farm d'Avenir uh, has the goal to, to prove that uh, natural agriculture can be more profitable than uh, chemical agriculture. And we are proving it uh, in the fields. Uh, with a micro farm in France uh, of 1.4 hectares. And uh, in on the fourth year, we will uh, manage to, to, to pay four uh, employees, uh, three employees, uh, which means uh, six times more employees uh, by uh, 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 surf surface than uh, conventional agriculture. And sorry for my English, my wife is Brazilian and I just I, I only speak uh, Portuguese at home. <laughs> yeah, mine is not better. So, Marc David. Hello, so La Ruche Qui Diwi, which is uh, called in English uh, Food Assembly, uh, is a platform for short food supply chain system. Uh, it allows uh, local communities to uh, be created on top of the platform in order to buy food directly from the local farmer. And we, we launched the platform five years ago, and now it's around 800 communities in six countries in Europe, serving around 100,000 orders every month. Nancy, <laughs> Yellow Seed. Yeah, hi, this is Nancy from Yellow Seed. Um, Yellow Seed is a platform, digital platform, connecting global farmers of chocolate or cacao this moment with specialty makers of chocolate um, and it's based on transparency and trust so the idea is if we can improve relationships we can then create new and emerging markets um, similar yeah we can talk about what the uh, why distributed food systems but um, we're we're still at the visibility stage so right now farmers can um, create product profiles and showcase their products and um, and create pricing and negotiate pricing with buyers and um, connecting them with trusted intermediaries that we're calling product hosts right now. So they offer value-added services, allowing them to really create their own product and service offering. Thank you. Miriam, do you want to talk about Open Food Network? Yeah. So the Open Food Network is an open source web infrastructure to support the decentralization of the food system by enabling people, communities, farmers, groups of farmers to create food hubs. So it's a marketplace where you can create a, an online shop and organize group sales or group buying. Okay, so the first question I want to ask you is to react to this presentation. Um, so first, is decentralization uh, the only solution or centralization the main problem to the food system today? Or is it possible to decentralize the system at 100%? Who wants to react first? Nancy? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think one of the big challenges that we're also trying to tackle is um, equity and conservation. So 
right now for chocolate. There's five companies that control 75% of the market, and most of that chocolate's bought from two countries, um, which are heavily loaded with, with things like child slavery um, and monoculture production. And so that leaves out most of the supply chain. 80, 90% of farmers can't participate. A, a number of buyers aren't able to source directly. Um, and they, they're most of the craft makers and specialty chocolate makers that you see, um, it's like a rounding error in the supply chain, basically. And they usually only only purchase one to two tons, not like a 25 metric ton. So it's there's really an opportunity to figure out how can we diversify the supply chain and how can we collaborate and coordinate together. It's very similar, yeah. Okay, Mike David or Maxime, maybe you want to react as you know. No. You wanna my point is that uh, what we need is growers, producers, and uh, we can decentralize wh what, whatever we want if we don't have grow we, w we can uh, um, invent and set up uh, a lot of platforms to, to help uh, to, to the cons consumers to, to buy. But if you don't have producers uh, in, in France, you have 570,000 farmers now, now, uh, today. And uh, 160,000 are going to retire in the seven years coming. Then we have to to form to to uh, to find a lot of producers, and uh, we know we know per permaculture. Permaculture, okay, you know. Then in permaculture, we say uh, it's not a problem. It the problem is the solution. Then. Uh, we have a problem in France. We have a, a problem of, of concentration of the sorry, concentration of the population in the big cities, and uh, our, all our, our countrysides are uh, desert, desertified. I don't know what to say, sinistre, and uh, it's uh, it's a pity. And uh, sorry, uh, ne ne next time we do it in summer summer time. Um, then we ha we have to 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 to, to repopulate to 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 make a urban exod exodus urban exodus, um, which is the contrary what the, of what happened uh, 40 years ago in France, and it's the contrary uh, a contrary the, uh, of what is happening now in India and in Asia, and a lot of uh, farmers are going to cities because, uh, uh, well. You know, you know that very well. Then uh, what I, what I, I, I'm sorry because in 10 minutes because of strikes in France, uh, I have to go and to take my train to go back to my farm. Under the rain. <coughs> Under the rain. It's a song. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, what I want to say is, uh, if you want to uh, get involved in the in the food um, food issue, first think if maybe you you don't want to be a, a farmer because it's really good. Uh, in, uh, micro farming, uh, Mir Miriam came to, to my farm uh, last week and, and she saw it's not the, the way that we produce now with big tractors and uh, chemicals. Really, on one hectare, we are three farmers to work. It's really stimulating because uh, we are looking uh, to the, uh, we are watching the nature. We are, it's, it's really different of what we knew before. Uh, during the 50 l past years in France. Okay, and if you don't want to be a farmer, maybe you can uh, invent some other, uh, uh, some other things to, to, to help. You are working on the production, on the distribution, but also on the financing with Farm d'Avenir. Is there is also... Yeah, with Bluebees. Yeah. Blue Alors, yeah, I created Bluebees, which is the platform fi uh, crowdfunding platform you, you, you saw. Thank you, uh, Miriam, for the advertising and um, yeah we help and we launched a, a challenge that's the second year last year we, we did it with uh, La Riche Kidiwi and uh, this year we will finance 20 uh, installations of, uh, of farmers in France uh, between 5,000 uh, euros until uh, to 50,000 euros and uh, yeah we are we, we want to stimulate that because really it's a, it's a great job and I, I am proud of be a, to be a farmer, and uh, I hope uh, that you will be farmers one day. You have a very nice word, and I will finish on that in French, which is pays which is a mix between farmer and agriculture yeah, and okay. territories in a way. Yeah, we have to innovate because uh, in the last decades, we, we the, all the farming industry uh, only innovated in uh, uh, in the seeds, GMO, or in the in the mechanical. Uh, I, I don't like that because 
when you watch what, uh, when you, you're looking what the, the a farmer is doing, day by day, you, you see that you can improve a lot his, uh, his quality of, uh, of work. And uh, one of, of the innovation we, we, we found is that uh, um, a farmer, he has to produce, he has to be technically uh, really good, and he has to be uh, really, uh, every day he has to work, and, uh, and he, cannot, he cannot be sick or ill the, the one single day because he will lose uh, his production. And at the same time, he has to be really uh, rigoureux, well, rigorous, <laughs> rigorous, that, that, that works like that, rigorous in, uh, in his uh, administra administrative uh, skills. And, and pericultor will be a new job, a new, new profession that we, uh, we, we, we th thought about. And it will be uh, an entrepreneur of the, territory, of the territory. He will do permaculture at the level of the at the level of a, uh, of a territory, and he will create like 10 small farms which will be in interaction one uh, with the others, which will uh, increase the resilience of the system and the, the economical... Um oh, c'est vraiment trop dur en anglais. Et qui, qui comprend pas l'anglais Ouais, vous avez bien. Who, does, uh, who doesn't uh, understand French? Uh, four, five people, ah, ten people. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Okay, I tried. I, I told them I will try. Want, okay. We can translate if you want. If no, you no, no, no problem. problem. But it's, uh, it's a speech that I have uh, very well in French. But uh, anyway, then pericultor is a new job, a new, new, new job and we will, we will launch the, the first uh, uh, promotion uh, of formation uh, to, to, to teach, uh, to, yeah, to for just former, to former uh, 10, nouveaux pays, 10 premiers pericultors. Voilà. Yes, but just to finish on one figure before leaving the conversation with Nancy, Marc David and, and, and Miriam, uh, do you have any figures on the future of Farm d'Avenir? We talk about decentralization, we need to have you know, some strong numbers to prove it's possible. So do you have any projection or prospectival work on what you're doing and the way yeah. you could promote another we economy? We have what we call a plaidoyer. <laughs> Alors ça, on va traduire plaidoyer. Cool. Lobbying. No, plaid alors plaidoyer. No, it's a, it's a, no, it's a big file. It's a big yeah. file. We 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 have to uh, to invent a new law uh, on agriculture. Uh, then uh, we we are working with uh, uh, the bureau de conseil. Putain, c'est horrible. Avec des, avec des bureaux de conseil. Et au poste faisait ça en portugais. Qui qui entend le portugais? Ah, à quel est-ce que nous entendons le français? Sont sont du Brésil? Ah, vamos vamos aussi, non? You are running short of time. I'm so sorry. I will, I, I, will lose, I, will, I will miss my train. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we are doing a, a lot of uh, of a different. Um, uh, we have a, a lot of different ways to 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 to, to improve uh, this uh, new agriculture, and I, I'm doing lobbying with the, the deputies or uh, or even the minister. And uh, we are doing a research with the, the INRA, INRA and J just one number, just okay. one number of you know in the five years to come, ten years to come. If Farm d'Avenir is a, a success, how many farmers can it's we have? How many I, I jobs? It's recorded. I don't know. Uh, no, <laughs> we, I think we have to to have dream uh, dreams uh, big enough not to to lose them of uh, sight, and uh, then uh, we want to 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 create uh, two hundred thousand jobs in uh, in agriculture. Within the I don't know twenty next years I hope. Okay. Yeah? Thank okay. you, Maxime. Ten thousand per year. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank, thank you, you very I'm much. Sorry. <laughs> really sorry. Uh. Good luck and the rain. <laughs> so, Nancy, Mark, David, just uh, I, I would like also to have. Um, thank you, Maxime, again. Um, yeah. Oh, your initiative, I mean, La Ruche Kidiwi or Yellow Seed, and we can talk about uh, Open Food Network as well, um, can help promote another food system. You know, what, is the, um, what are the answers you are giving to this uh, centralization problem? Um, yeah, I, I'm going to make a, a quick link with uh, production issues because um, production and distribution uh, food system are, are strongly linked and showing that uh, a new decentralized food system is working uh, is also going to have a big influence on the producers themselves. Because in, in the past, what we were selling to, the, to farmers, like if you want to succeed, you need to have like an industrial farm. And that's why they built such a big farms and so on. And 90% of the land now in France, maybe even more, is uh, uh, industrialized. And now we need to, s to show them, okay, you can sell directly to customer, but 
not only in an uh, old-fashioned way, like going to the farmer's market and so on, maybe in a more uh, modern digital way and make it more efficient. And uh, you can succeed and you can have a, a success up to that. And that's why with our initiatives, with a, a decentralized uh, food distribution system, uh, we also uh, influence uh, new farmers uh, to install and so on. And we s we're starting to see a big shift uh, in France. Uh, up to maybe a few years ago, there was still like a, a big tension, like most, either you were like industrial farmer or you were like a, an alternative guy doing like a small farm, you know, and people were not respecting you. And now it's really changed uh, in the, the last few years. We really see that even big farmers see that you can succeed and you can really uh, value, valorize your, your products, uh, going back to a more uh, a small scale farming. And people now, even like the industrial farmers, also see uh, the excess of industrial farming. And now they want to go to the transition. And I think if we want to succeed the transition, we shouldn't only focus on like uh, new farmers setting up uh, small farms and or existing uh, small farms, but we really need to support existing industrial farmer to do this transition uh, step by step. So I think it's a both uh, production and distribution are important uh, to go uh, in that uh, in, in the direction. Just I, don't, I didn't answer your question. I answered yeah. the previous question. <laughs> so can you <laughs> ask it again? No, no, it's just uh, oh, your initiative is providing the solution. But uh, can you also give us some numbers about uh, you know La Ruche Kidiwi today? Uh, what does it represent exactly? So La, la Ruche Kidiwi today is still uh, very small if you compare to the whole food system. Uh, in France, only we have around uh, 4,000 farmers delivering 700 communities. It's around uh, 100,000 uh, people ordering uh, um, often on the platform. And if, if we compare by the numbers, which is interesting, like whole or uh, network is doing half the size of uh, what is doing one big uh, supermarket. Hmm. The one big supermarket is doing uh, 100 million euros of sale per year. So we are still very, very far to compete with industrial farming. Because even if, especially in France, a lot of people want to go back to short food supply chain, like buying directly to the local farmers, but they want to have everything. They want to have the local food, the community side, but they also want to have the convenience and the price. And up to now, even if you go to CSA, if you go to our model, you need to pre-order online or you need to get a, a contract with the farmer. Uh, it's a lot of effort. So a lot of people, if you ask them, they would love to do it. But in, uh, in the reality, a lot of people are still going uh, downstairs to their uh, daily shop or their grocery shop. Of course. Thank you, Mark David. Nancy, uh, you are from California. We are in the US. It's a huge country. You've got some of the problem you know, with the food system as well. Uh, what is your look on the, it's a P2P and B2B system you are building with Yellow Seed. Um, do you believe it will provide some solution to this centralization problem? Will it answer some of the international trade system uh, problem too? Yeah. Um, we piloted this year something called collaborative trade, which is if um, people that are impacted by a system, can they work on that system to improve it for all? Um, and the, you know, the platform that we have is sort of what the process will result in. And it's the surface of like uncovering the next step. Um, we, we did an accelerator program where there was six sessions and we gathered about 50 different companies, really small innovative companies, really large companies like World Cocoa Foundation, Cocoa Link, um, Grameen Foundation, a lot of mobile apps, um, a lot of big chocolate makers, small chocolate makers and farmers, and um, we together learned that, um, we learned a lot of the trends and we basically created a, a kind of a, a map and a view of what's possible and what needs to change. Um, and it's really nourishing and great to be here because it's like most of the things that we as a collective community already know and are already building around, you know, why equal access, why decentralization, why, you know, what are the ways for transparency and empowerment um, a lot of these rules, like the kind of the new rules of connect connection, um, are embedded in maybe what we're doing, but it was like, what was great about that um, process that we did, it was it allowed everyone to see through hearing everyone else's experience, wow, we really do need um, not only one-way communication, but like really dynamic, multi-stakeholder communication that's happening on an ongoing basis. Um, we need the farmer's voice to be in the conversation. 
Um, fair trade isn't working anymore. Um, we need a way that people can actually define what success means to them um, and chart a way to, to help them chart that progress. Um, let's see, I have a list. Um, <laughs> the big, kind of the, the big elephant in the room is that the consumer um, holds the power. So right now, if you're really trying to diversify a supply chain and really create a way for pro like a lot of different smaller products to be part of that system, um, the consumer needs to be on board. So right now, for chocolate, you have more farmers that have products than buyers that are really organized enough to buy them. You have a lot of buyers that want them and can't access them. So there are all these kind of breakdowns of like, wow, if we just had the information, if we just had some shared language. Right now, chocolate doesn't have a shared language. They don't agree on what flavor profiles are, for example. So it's really hard to coordinate. It's hard to, for even the big distributors like Ecom to talk about um, to talk about like what are the market, what's even the market information? That was one of their challenges they brought up. Um, so there's right now Yellow Seeds really looking at like what are those informational layers to start to build the, like a common um, conversation. And then after that, after the information layer and the visibility of that next step, it's we're really looking at what are these ways um, for transparency. And by transparency on like a really basic level, we mean like are the farmers better off? You know, is everyone else in the supply chain better off? Um, so we're still in information gathering phase, putting all the pieces together. Um, yeah, I'm really, go ahead. Okay, yeah. thank you, Nancy, yeah. uh, if it's clear. Yeah, yeah, it's time for questions. I've got some questions for you too, but um, I want to open uh, the question to the room. So raise your hand, please. Uh, we will uh, give you a micro if you need to ask one question. We can take one, two questions, and then I can ask. We've got 10 minutes in front of us. Please just, you know, stand up and you can introduce yourself too, please. Okay, uh, I'm Victor. I'm from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Um, I have a, also a platform to connect uh, agricultures directly to people. And my question is related to the subject of, uh, of the, the conference here. It's about uh, why um, most part of the projects uh, didn't go well, and we have some good examples here, so such as Open Food and, and La Houche. So I would like to know uh, uh, what's the not what's the secret, but what are the steps for for a collaborative economy to succeed in, in this new scenario? Is it clear? Is there, is there another question? We can take two or three questions all together. Yes. No. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you for hearing me. I'm Shannon MacArthur from Kamloops, British Columbia, Canada. And what I haven't heard here today is how we're going to feed the people in the cities. We talk about um, transportation. Why are we not creating the gardens, more gardens, inside the cities, so we just go around the subject of transportation altogether. I have a project that does that, and it does more, and I really want to talk to you guys about this, but what are you doing for the people in the cities now? How do they fit in your plans? Okay, thank you for these two first questions. Yeah, yeah, do you want to answer first? Or so the recipe for success and the way we can feed people in cities? Yeah, well, um, the Open Food Network is a very young project, so probably the Food Assembly has a much longer experience on that. We, I won't say that we are yet a success, but we are a global community. So the Open Food Network started in Australia some years ago in 2012, and now the project has been developed in nine countries or is developing in nine countries. So it's really uh, the community-based project where community discover the open food network. It's open source, so they decide to deploy the infrastructure where they live. And uh, so um, it's really a powerful tool to empower people. I started, I deployed it because I wanted to start a project when I was in Norway, in Oslo. And I started a buying group and I needed a tool just we were 20 people willing to buy as a group and we needed a tool so that's why we 
deployed the open food network just to have a tool to organize ourselves. So we live in cities. We don't grow in cities, but we live in cities. And we, we could, thanks to that tool, we could just connect together and in a week, in a week we just make two phone calls to two farmers and we could buy together as a group. So for me, the success is more in very small local initiatives that, that have the good tools to operate and, and then which can multiply and um, pollinate so that more and more people can do the same. So of course, I, I also do believe that models like, like uh, the food assembly, simple models that can uh, duplicate are, are very uh, important. But I also, for me, the open food network infrastructure strength is to let the community define what is the model which is adapted to their local situation. And I wanted to react also to one thing that you said, Mark David, because uh, in, in our case, we, we were just 20 people, we were, we were 40 people in our, in our mailing list. But the products were, it was very convenient because people were delivered at home. We were buying, buying together in our building. So it was a very convenient situation. And the products were 20% cheaper than in supermarkets and conventional products in supermarkets, but we were buying local organic food. So I, what I like in, in the Open Food Network is that it's totally open so you can invent the business model and the operational model that you want and that is the most adapted to your situation. We are doing that on a volunteer based, but we have built a business model that enable a person to run a, a community hub in a neighborhood with 50 people and, and earning a living for working one day per week on it. So, uh, so I think the importance is the diversity, the eco-diversity of the initiatives and what the Food Assembly does is awesome. What the, f the Open Food Network and all the different type of food hubs does is also uh, awesome. Yeah, I think <laughs> it's, a, it's a question of supply as well. Uh, I think as you said the numbers are quite, uh, you know, s low compared to the whole food system. So it's a question of time as well. Nancy, do you have any recipe for success for our Brazilian <laughs> philo or any answer to, to that woman from yeah. Colombia? The first, what was the first question? I think, I think it was recipe of success uh, yeah. for this kind of platform, or maybe I'm yeah. how too how simple. Like Sorry? How, how to engage people and avoid failure? Yeah, it's the same. That's the same. No. About yeah, failure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think um, engagement is key, and participation is key for any of these community sourced mar marketplaces to work. Um, and we're right at that phase of like how, how do we create a structure and, a, and partnerships for them to not only participate to, but to own it. And so what are these, so we're just currently in partnership formation. Um, I, the, the local, to, you know, to answer the question locally is a really important one, um, especially when we're like, you know, cacao is interesting because we're creating like local collaboration, but mainly in the US for the buyer side because um, cacao grows in the tropics, but I think the model will apply once it's replicated. Um, it's, it's really about self-organizing and it depends on the partnerships um, that we find and who's aggregating at what level and how we, um, and the resource sharing that happens in the local level. So it's a good question. Mark David, do you have any answers to give to public? Yeah, I think one, um, one part of the success of uh, La Ruche was, um, was the, um, the way we developed the business in a very decentralized way. And <laughs> we didn't decide that we were going to manage the food communities ourselves, but we uh, created this role of the local host and we gave all the tools and we really empowered the local host so he can <coughs> look for his farmer is going to work for uh, with uh, the member is going to work with and he really feels it's his community you know it's building his community his food marketplace uh, on top of our platform and this network now we have of 800 uh, 800 food ho uh, host is very very strong and we started like uh, for the host as a, an additional revenue for them and now we see how strong the project is for them it has a, a lot of social value like half of the hosts want to make it their full-time uh, uh, um, job. So it's very interesting. So uh, that's one of the answer. And to answer to the um, su uh, relocalization of, uh, of the um, production in, in the cities, we are a strong believer at uh, La Ruche uh, that we really need urban farming and we see it in uh, dense cities like uh, Paris or London 
uh, that's very difficult to, to source food locally. It's not the case in uh, most of the other places in, uh, uh, in the country. Uh, <coughs> we believe we need to support and we need to have a platform that can work uh, as well as uh, with uh, uh, small-scale farmers uh, in rural areas, but also with urban farmers uh, in the cities. And we, we really try right now to support a lot of uh, urban farming initiatives that are starting in Paris. It's very new in Paris. I would say it's like year one of urban farming. Uh, it's maybe more developed in uh, other cities in the, in the US or in Canada. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of uh, entrepreneurs that are starting uh, uh, initiatives and there's a big support of uh, Paris uh, mayorship uh, and city hall uh, to support these initiatives, to give uh, land, to give room to do uh, uh, as well uh, outdoor urban farming or also indoor urban farming. Thank you, it's a question of sovereignty as well. Uh, are there any other questions? We've got uh, 30 <laughs> seconds if you still have one question. There's no more session afterwards, so we can talk all night. Yeah, yeah. but I think we have no. to <laughs> free the room. <laughs> we have to leave. <laughs> no, but we have time for one more question. Yeah, maybe. I think we can take one more question. Please, introduce yourself and Thank you. Hi, Armin Stoenagel. Um, I came in a bit late, so I don't know whether you touched already upon this topic. I wanted to ask you on the ownership structures and the financing behind. You. Did you touch on this topic already? No. Not yet. It's okay, a because question. I know La Ruche is um, having many VCs, so to say, inside. Is this changing the way you are um, trying to have an impact? So, do you have, for example, to close your system? Can't you do open source anymore, etc.? Are these um, certain? So, how does the current VC structure um, has an impact on on your business? And on the other side, for the others, how does the financing and the ownership work um, with you? Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> so I, c I can answer for the Open Food Network. So we are a commons which belong to the community, so we're fully open source, and it's a totally distributed network, so every local entity in Australia, in UK, in Norway, in France, are, uh, decide up upon their business model and their legal entity, but we, uh, w one of our core value is independence, so, so far we have no VC, and if that happened, we would be very careful to remain fully independent because we have to care of and govern demo democratically the commons we are building. About so, so in Australia it's a charity, in UK it's a community interest company, in Norway it's a non-profit organization. So we are, on the governance side, we, are, we want to really to be fully democratic organizations. On the business model, again, every local entity decide upon its business model. In Australia, the, we take a 2% commission, uh, capped to $50, that's their model, because they want this to remain very accessible for people to build their own product on it. In uh, Norway also we take a 2% commission. In France we want to experiment a model which will be also a 2% commission or other forms of contribution because we want to open up also the space for initiatives and experimentations. For example, one of the first beta testers in north of France, uh, um, cooperative uh, supermarket, uh, no, yeah, a small, small uh, online uh, cooperative supermarket, they uh, have um, uh, decided to experiment volunteer contribution, so conscious contribution. So we are totally, we want to support all those experimentation. And our reflection is if you use the commons, you have to contribute to the commons. But there are different ways to contribute to the commons. It can be with money, but it can be with time, by contributing to coding, by like uh, communicating about the project. So that's, that's our reflection. Can you turn it off? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. It's okay. Um, this is top of mind. I don't have an answer exactly to this question. We're formed as a, uh, under an umbrella of a nonprofit, um, but looking to hybridize this year and um, have some sort of shared ownership model that allows not only farmers, buyers, and intermediaries to be members or part of part owners, but also we're in conversations with a lot of folks around quality um, assessment and um, which is actually kind of a big, yeah, so these levels of verification, crowd verification that's more open and accessible, um, and also finance is a big piece. To, so how do, how do funds flow in and out of the marketplace? Um, so in conversations around how to increase um, or decrease the need for due diligence and vetting, 
So what are, what are the ways that we can start to really in create those informational systems? So I uh, invite people that have ideas of creative models um, to come find me. Thanks. Um, yeah, of course, we raised money from, uh, from VCs, I think around 10 million euros since uh, we, st we started. Um, that, that's why that's uh, mostly the reason why we, we, we succeeded because um, uh, developing uh, um, such a platform um, takes a lot of time and a lot of uh, talents and uh, you need to recruit them and we, today we have around 20 engineers uh, within the, the company and um, of course we, if, we, if we could have uh, developed the platform maybe with our own money we w would have done it but uh, I mean it was not possible. No. I think like what uh, Open Food Network is also great because they try to do it in a no post open source way, but uh, um, doing it with uh, money and with investment, we, we are able to, to grow the project uh, much, much faster. And one of our mission, we, 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 have, um, we want to have a big impact. Uh, in a way, uh, decentralized food system, uh, community supported agriculture was already existing before us. And, uh, if we are not investing in a platform, we are not able to grow these initiatives. And that's our objective, our initial uh, objective is to make local food system um, um, more um, accessible to a bigger public. And developing such a platform is complex because you need to have the good tools with a great UX and UI for uh, three different stakeholders uh, to allow to, to uh, manage all the steps of the, of the food value chain. And we feel we, and not even, we didn't even do like 10% of what we still have to do to really make a decentralized food system working and uh, accessible to more people. So after the, the, the question is mostly like, uh, uh, do you have VC that can understand your vision and do you have VC that, are, uh, the, that have the patience uh, to uh, uh, accept that uh, developing such a, a business does not give like a, um, growth from the, the one that you need it takes a lot of time uh, because in a very decentralized model you need to uh, you need to train you need to find each uh, local host uh, to support the development of the community and you cannot grow like that in a second so you need to find uh, the good partners uh, that support your vision and that also support like the outcome uh, of uh, of uh, their investment and uh, we try to be very clear and very uh, um, difficult with what we request with, uh, from the VC, and we we didn't select like the uh, the VC like that, the first one we we find in, in the street, and uh, always very clear about that. And that's one of the reasons why we went to the to the US to to raise money because we we find a, a VC w which is a USV that really understand that uh, uh, we are a very long term project uh, with a very decentralized vision. Uh, that maybe we want, uh, we, don't, we don't want to sell the company, we don't want to do an IPO, we want to share some equity with the network, that's very innovative way of thinking. And you can find partners that understand very hybrid company, and maybe you, we can take the most, we can make the most out of the shareholders and the stakeholders and try to involve everyone to build something better. And I talk longer about that tomorrow in another panel. Okay, <laughs> I've got time tomorrow. I think it's the same as... Okay, so if you want to know more about the model, you can go. Thank you very much to you all. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much.